All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let us continue. Let's do our final little piece. We are now moving away from wills and we are starting the estates part of things. So estates, now we are talking about winding up the deceased estate. This is a process that is not too complicated. Uh, we can sort of do it in step form of the different steps we need to obtain. So keep in mind, uh, everyone, that uh, the will might have appointed you as an executor, but you can't act as executor until the master's office has given you what they call a letter of executorship. So we need to obtain this letter of executorship. In order to do so, let's start with step one. Step one is we need to report the deceased estate to the master's office. So we report the deceased estate to the master's office. Now, the purpose of us reporting the estate is so that we can obtain a letter of executorship. That then gives us the authority to proceed with winding up this deceased estate. So there are a couple documents you will need to give the master's office when reporting the estate. And these documents are very important, ladies and gents. What, what do you need to give the master's office when you report the estate? Well, first of all, the first three documents I'm going to mention is standard documents. Uh, your law firms, uh, if you're dealing with estates, will have them. Otherwise, you can just print them from, um, from the internet. But the documents is called, the first one is called a death um, notice. A death notice. Uh, this is simply just uh, particulars of the deceased person, in other words. The second document is called um, a inventory. Now, we should have heard the term inventory before in civil law as well. When we hear the term inventory, we should think a list of assets with an estimated value attached to them. That's exactly what this inventory document is. You are giving the master's office a list of the assets in the deceased estate with an approximate valuation of these assets in the deceased estate. Now, this is very important because if the asset value of the deceased estate is less than 250,000 Rand, you then have what they call a section 18 subsection 3 estate. So when you have a section 18 3 estate, that's an estate that has an asset value of less than 250,000 Rand. What happens then is the master's office does not issue you a letter of executorship. They issue you with a letter of authority. Right. So it it's sorry, pretty much uh, the same sorry thing, to except you. Yes. Sorry to disturb you. Can you please just repeat that section something that you were talking about now? Section 8 estate or something? Sorry. Section Thanks. 18. So it's 1 8, subsection 3. It's an 18 3 estate. Right. So that means that the estate value was less than 250,000 Rand. The master's office will, will, will issue you then with a um, a letter of authority. I'm sorry, Kyle, now, can I? The okay. only... Yes. Before you move on, when you are doing your inventory, would you have to include um, the deceased's policies, uh, as in uh, death benefits, um, which include burial benefits and, and, and the works. Any, any monies that are being paid into the deceased estate will have to be included. Whether it's assets that are currently existing or policies that are going to be paid into the deceased estate, whatever the case may be, anything paid in the deceased estate will be included in the inventory. Right. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. All right. So, when we report the estate, we have our death notice document, we have our inventory, and the third document is called an acceptance of trust as executor. I'll say that again. An acceptance of trust as executor. This is now details of yourself. You are going to be the executor of this deceased estate. So the master's office will obviously need certain particulars of yourself. That's an acceptance of trust as executor. Ladies and gentlemen, these are three standard documents. Um, 
that you would have to provide to the master's office when trying to become the executor of a deceased estate. Other than that, there is other fundamental documents you also need to supply them with. For example, when answering the question over where, what you need to produce to the master's office when reporting an estate, think to yourself, what would the master's office need to have a complete idea or understanding over what's going on in this deceased estate. Who's going to get what? So first of all, if there was a will involved, the original will would be of utmost importance. So there's a potential fourth document. If there was a will involved, you'll need to provide the master's office with the original will. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to think both ways now. We've got to think what happens if something is there and what happens if something is not there. So if there is no will, it means the person died intestate. So I wouldn't be able to provide a will to the master's office. If the person died intestate, you will have to provide the master's office with an affidavit confirming who needs to inherit. They call it a next of kin affidavit as well. Next of kin referring to who are the family members that are going to inherit from the deceased estate. So keep in mind, if there's a will, provide the master's office with the original will. If there's no will, Give the master's office a next of kin affidavit where you indicate, according to interstate law, who will inherit. Because ultimately, the master's office needs an understanding of who the beneficiaries are going to be to this deceased estate. Moving away from wills or interstate law, obviously, what could play an important part is your marriage regime. So, if you are married in community of property, when I say if you, I mean if the deceased person is married in community of property, you would need to provide the master's office with the marriage certificate. Now, you may not be married in community of property, but you may be married out of community of property. If you are married out of community of property, you will then be supplying the master's office with your anti-nuptial contract. So it depends on your marriage regime. You'll either have to give a marriage certificate or an anti-nuptial contract. Contract. Ladies and gentlemen, let's go further. We are telling the master's office we need a letter of executorship because this person died and we've been appointed as executor. The master's office does not just accept from you that someone died. So you'll need to provide them with the death certificate as well. So provide the master's office with the death certificate of the deceased person. So if you, have a, if you have a look at your notes so far, you should see there, there was a three standard documents, a death notice, inventory, and acceptance of trust as executor. After that, we thought about who's getting what. So it's either the original will or the next of kin affidavit if it was interstate law. After that, we thought of the marriage regime. Was the deceased person married? If yes, what was it? Was it in or out of communal property? If it was in, it's a uh -huh. marriage certificate. If it was out, it was an anti-nuptial contract. After that, we said we need to prove to the master's office that the deceased person indeed died. So we'll need to give a death certificate as well. Carl, sorry to just chip in. Yes. Um, I just wanted to, with the three standard documents, um, the third one, acceptance for the trust as executor. Um, so we'd obviously substitute that with an... Um, undertaking an acceptance of master's directions if it's an 18-3 um, estate? 100% correct. 100% correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now, now, now we've got to think also, ladies and gentlemen, now we, we, just make sure we, we mute it, ladies and gents. Now, if you Mr. look at the Carl, picture we're painting for the master's office. Okay, let's do it that way, ladies. I think that might be an easier way. Let's go through the steps to wind up the deceased estate, and then afterwards we'll, we'll open questions. So, if you miss something, you will have the opportunity at the end to ask the question. Let's do it that way. Okay, so back to reporting the deceased estate. Look at the picture you painted to the master's office. You've proved who died. You've proved who must receive what. Um, you have indicated whether there was a marriage or not. 
But now, obviously, there's beneficiaries. So if you are saying the children must inherit or John down the street must inherit, the identity documents of the beneficiaries or alternatively, the birth certificates of the beneficiaries will also need to be supplied to the master's office. So have a look at who's benefiting from the will or benefiting from interstate law and provide proof of those individuals that they are alive that you can do through identity documents or you can do through birth certificates if it is the children of the deceased person that must inherit. So ladies and gents, that's a rough outline okay, of what type of documentation we'll need to give to the master's office when we report the deceased estate. We provide those documents to the master's office and then we wait for our letter of executorship. Once we receive the letter of executorship from the master's office, we now have permission to act as executor of the deceased estate. In other words, we take over now. Okay, we act on behalf of the deceased. So that was step one. That led to our letter of executorship. Let's move to step two. What we now need to do is open a deceased estate bank account. I'll say that again. We open a deceased estate bank account. Now, the idea behind this, ladies and gents, is we need to close down all the bank accounts of the deceased person and transfer the money into one single bank account. There is policies that may need to pay out. Again, those policies must pay out into the bank account we open. And the idea for opening a, an estate bank account is that all, all monies coming in and out of the deceased estate is monitored through this bank account because obviously there's going to be bank statements. So the master's office is able to see what money is coming in, and what money is going out. In other words, they can see if you as executor are stealing money or acting negligently or doing things with money you're not supposed to do. All right. So that is why we go and open an estate bank account. All monies will go into that account. At this stage, we have an understanding of what assets and what money is in this deceased account. But we do not know for sure what are the liabilities or the creditors of the deceased person. Did they owe anyone money? So we move on to step three. Step three is we do a section 29 advertisement. So it's called a section 29. When I refer to sections, I'm referring to the Estates Act. So a section 29 advertisement. This is an advertisement you place in the local newspaper as well as the government gazette. So I'll say that again. Step three is to do a section 29 advertisement in the newspaper and the government gazette. Now, the aim of this newspaper, or sorry, the aim of this advertisement is to advertise to all possible creditors of the deceased person that this person has passed away and if the deceased person um, owed them money, they need to lodge a claim. In other words, we're trying to figure out who are the liabilities, who are the creditors. You know, you'll see big institutions like banks and so forth. They have employees whose sole job pretty much is to look for advertisements of people who pass away to see if there's any claims that they need to push forward. Now, ladies and gents, you know, in reality, well, in theory, what you need to know is that place, you need to place a Section 29 advertisement in the Gazette and newspaper advertising the death of the person and giving creditors an opportunity to lay a claim. In practice, I would advise that you go a bit above and beyond this. I would advise that you look at the bank statements of the deceased person as well and have a look if you can figure out if they were paying people money. Perhaps they were paying off a bond on a house or a loan on a vehicle or a loan on this or whatever the case may be. Pick up the phone, contact these creditors you know about and tell them, listen, I'm going to place my Section 29 advert now. Please look out for it. You need to lodge a claim against the deceased estate. The reason why I do this is I don't want people coming later on and saying, no, I didn't see the advert. I have to lodge a claim. That could negatively impact your whole process because there is the opportunity you might need to go back and include them. Okay. So back to this advert you placed in the newspaper and gazette, an additional point I want you to add is the advertisement must 
give the creditors not less than 30 days and not more than three months from date of advert to lodge their claim. I'll say that again. The advertisement in the newspaper and gazette gives potential creditors not less than 30 days, but not more than three months. In other words, 30 days to three months. And during that time period from date of advert, they have not less than 30 days and not more than three months to come and lodge a claim against the deceased estate. In other words, to come and prove that the deceased owed them money. In other words, all right. So this step three is now us determining what was the liabilities. Because step one and two, we pretty much had an idea of what all the assets were. We had all the policies pay out. We had the bank money. The bank accounts closed and paid in. Our inventory determined what the value of the different assets were. But we lacked an understanding of what the liabilities were. Because obviously we're trying to get to the deceased person's net worth, which is assets minus liabilities. So in step three, we placed our advertisements so that we can determine what the liabilities were. At this stage, once step three has been completed, we now have an understanding of the asset value and the liability or creditor value of the deceased estate. We can now move to step four. Step four is draft the liquidation and distribution account. To draft the liquidation and distribution account. That is what I said we will be focusing on tomorrow and Thursday. Ladies and gents, I'm not going to keep saying liquidation and distribution account. I will from here and after refer to it as the L&D account. Okay, I'm just giving you a heads up on that. Don't worry about the ins and outs now. We'll learn that step tomorrow. Okay, so step four, we have to draft the L&D account. Now, the purpose of this is we clearly set out the assets, the liabilities, who gets what. We look at the marriage regime. We look at legacies. We look at heirs. I mean, that's if there was a will, obviously. But if it was interstate law, there, there wouldn't be legacies. It would just be air. So we'd look at that. And we'd clearly set out, in other words, who's getting what from this deceased estate. Okay. Once you've done the L&D, you then move over to step five. Step five is another advertisement we need to do. Okay. We are then going to do another advertisement, again in the local newspaper as well as the government gazette. So we're going to do another advertisement in the newspaper as well as the government gazette. Now, the purpose of this advertisement is we are advertising to all interested parties that this L&D account that we did is going to lie open for inspection for 21 days. I'll say that again. The purpose of this advertisement is we are now advertising to all interested parties that this L&D account that we drafted, our step four that we did, is going to lie open for inspection for 21 days. So ladies and gents, obviously it will say it's going to lie open for inspection at this place from, you know, 1 February to 21 February, for argument's sake. Now, you see the term I use there for all interested parties. Who is an interested party? It would be the creditors who lodged the claim against your estate. It could be the surviving spouse to see if they're getting what they're entitled to in terms of the marriage regime. It could be the legatees. It could be the heirs. Anyone benefiting from this deceased estate, it is in their interest to go have a look at your L&D account. Go have a look to see what they are getting because there is a possibility that you drafted your L&D account incorrectly. And those interested parties could turn around and say to you, listen, you've made a mistake in your L&D account. I am objecting to your L&D account because you haven't given me the correct amount or you've made a calculation error. If it is true what they are saying, then it means, and this is the bad part, then it means we'll have to go back and amend our L&D and then do step five again, because then we'll have to re-advertise it for another 21 days. 
So this is the kicker. This is why it's so important we get our LNDs correct. Because if we get it wrong and someone successfully objects to it, it means we have to do it again and re-advertise it again. So now we're starting to act a bit negligently because we're not doing our job correctly. And that's where that security we spoke about yesterday could come into play because it doesn't, it's not for free to advertise. Hey? It's costing the estate money, the deceased estate money, every time we do those advertisements. So step five was your advertisement for inspection for 21 days, giving everyone opportunity to have a look at the l &D. Now the crux is we have to get through step five without any objections, without any errors. If we can get through those 21 days and there's no problems, we can then move on to step six. Step six is we are now allowed to distribute the estate. So we will now go and pay the creditors what they're entitled to. We'll go and sort the marriage out, give the legatees what they're entitled to, and lastly, sort the heirs out. Obviously, we're entitled to our payment as well, 3.5% of the total asset value, and we'll take that payment last. So step six was you now go and distribute the deceased estate in terms of what your l d account said. Ladies and gentlemen, what once you have distributed the estate, you move on to the seventh and final step. You then go and show the master's office what you have done. If the master's office is happy with everything you've done and you've done everything correctly, they will then give you a pay slip. Sorry, I'm lying. They will give you a filing slip, not a pay slip, a filing slip. A filing slip is just a document that says your job is done, in other words. So the state has been properly wound up. You're no longer the executor because the job is done. So that's what we strive for, to get to step seven. Ladies and gentlemen, I've sort of shortened and summarized the steps because the idea is I want you to be able, from step one to the point of the filing slip, be able to list what are the steps we have to go through in order to wind up a deceased estate. You know, and if you have a look at those steps, they're not difficult steps, but I see possible questions there. I see questions relating to what documents would you need to provide the master's office with when reporting the estate. I see a question regarding an 18.3 estate. I see questions regarding the Section 29 advertisements and the other advertisement for 21 days. You know, and obviously the l d account is going to be a big question come exam time as well. So we need to understand these steps, process one to, uh, to the last step in terms of winding the deceased estate up. And if you look at it, you know, one could argue that these aren't complicated steps. I mean, if you explain this to a lay person, they might be able to do it. The problem is a lay person would not know what you need to do to report the estate. So that might be a challenge. And a lay person would definitely not know how to draft an l &D account. So that might be their challenge as well. One thing I can mention is that if I go back to the 18.3 estate, where the asset value was less than 250,000 Rand, we said you got a letter of authority. The moment you get a letter of authority, the rules say you follow these steps when winding up a deceased estate, but you do not need to do the l &D account. So I'll say that again. If you're dealing with an 183 estate, you do not need to do the L and D account. That is why you'd often see um, family members with letters of authorities winding up deceased estates because they just need to follow these steps. They don't need to know how to do the L and D. It's people with letters of executorship that it's perhaps in your best interest that a, a qualified professional person is dealing with bigger estates because a lay person wouldn't know how to do the L and D account, which is obviously what we're going to look at tomorrow and Thursday. So those were the steps, you know, in a summary way of winding up a deceased estate. Um, let's hear if there's any questions regarding those steps. Karabul here. Karabul is listen. Um, I'm a bit confused, to be honest, regarding the steps, right? Um, there was an audio that I listened to, right? And uh, I don't remember or hearing you mentioning step four about determining the solvency of the estate when the creditors exceed the whole value of the estate. Okay, so if if if, if someone exceeds uh, the value, meaning the creditors exceed the assets, 
we then we then switch over to insolvency law, which is obviously not for the subject, but rather for insolvency law. So, I mean, uh, the basic thing is if your liabilities exceed your assets, we have a problem. Then we can't distribute your estate and your estate is then insolvent. Then insolvency law may kick in, which is a discussion for, a, for another day. Okay, because then now for step five, I understand the drafting, the liquidation and all of that, because then I have um, sub paragraphs here, um, which I believe you're going to detail tomorrow about liquidation account, estate duty account and all those kind of things. Because then as step six, step six, I have section 35 as the advertisement. That would be the inspection for 21 days. Yes. Um, so yeah, I was just a bit confused because you mentioned that under step five. Yes, well, all I've done is I've left out the insolvency law part because I didn't feel it's applicable for the subject. So you might have listened to another audio of mine in the past where I referred to it, but I, I, I don't find it necessary to indulge into different aspects of law now. Um, I don't want to confuse the subject, you know, but ultimately you are correct when you say once people lay their uh, claims as creditors, you know, one can determine whether the deceased estate is solvent or not. And if it's not solvent, you know, insolvency law may kick in, which may, you know, sort of render some of the rest of the steps invalid because we'd be focusing on insolvency law. Okay. So um, if you don't mind, then, is it, um, is it possible if you can just repeat step four and six for me, please? Okay, so one was reporting the estate, two was opening the estate bank account, three was that section 29 um, advertisement in the Gazette a newspaper giving the creditors that 30 days to three months to lodge their claim. Four was drafting the L and D account, liquidation distribution account. Um, five, then was that a section thirty-five advert in the Gazette newspaper where you give all interested parties um, twenty-one days to inspect your L and D account. And six, then was where you go and distribute the deceased estate in terms of what your L and D account says. The six is when you distribute the deceased estate. In terms of what the LD account says, and then step okay. seven was when you went and showed the master what you did, and they then gave you a filing slip. Does that clarify it? It does. Thank you so much. Uh, perfect. Okay, yeah, Zama. Yes, Carl, thank you for taking my question. Uh, when we are preparing for this, do we have to keep in mind the specific section like your section 29 for notifying the creditors, section 35 advertisement as well, or we just mention the steps, you do this for this purpose, you do this for this purpose, and it's all covered? Yes, Thank you. Nice. Look, uh, for, for this particularly, I would remember section 29 and section 35. The reason being is, you know, uh, Somewhere in the question, they might refer to a section 29 advertisement. And uh, uh, if you didn't know it was a 29 advertisement, which entails the advertising to the creditors to lodge their claim, then you wouldn't be able to follow the question. So I, I think keep in mind section 29 and section 35 is the two different advertisements that need to be done in the process of winding up the deceased estate. Hello, Kyle. Isaac here. Hi, Kyle. It's Zianda. Okay, I heard Isaac Hi. and then I heard Zianda. So let's do let's do Isaac first. Okay, Kyle. Thank you very much. Yeah. I just want to know: Is it necessary that after you've done your L and D account to send it to the master's office for approval, or can you just continue with the section thirty-five advertisement and so everything after you've done everything, all the steps? Thank you. Look, you can, I can't. I can't be here and be. Uh, someone's not on mute. Ladies and gents, we can hear your conversations. Someone can't be here or there. Make sure you're muted. All right. So, 
look, that that uh, um, that uh, L&D that you did, it's, look, it's not a formal requirement that it needs to be sent for approval first. You can do it so, all right? I know of attorneys who do send it through to the master's office just to show them what they've done. But ultimately, the test lies when you lay it open for the 21 days for inspection because the approval is surpassing 21 days without any objections. Or let me rather say surpassing 21 days without any valid objections. Because the moment there's an objection to the LND, that is referred to the master. And the master makes the ultimate decision over whether they accept the objection or they decline the objection. So it's not a formal requirement that it gets sent first for approval. But I do know of some attorneys who like to do it that way. Thank you, Kyle. 100%. Hi, Kyle. It's up on here. Um, so the, there was a there was another lady who was next, and then we'll come to the gentleman there after. Um, that was me, Nam, sir. Yes, go for it. Okay, Kyle. Um, can I just ask something? My connection cut when you were still discussing step one. So I only got up until that step two is opening the bank account, but I didn't get any notes on that. And then my on second question one. is that um, does section 35 apply to the 21 days advertisement? Okay, so, so to, to help you first, look, step one is a long story. You know, that, 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 that's quite a long story. So what I would suggest is these... Uh, these um, recordings or these uh, lectures are recorded. So just have a look on the recording about step one, but step one dealt with reporting the deceased estate so that you can obtain a letter of executorship. So we, we spoke about one. a number of, yes? Was it I step two you missed? Up until, it's, it's step two that I missed. I have step one up until you re, you, you you bring the, de the death certificate. Then my connection cuts after that. I don't know what happened. And then okay, when it, so when it came back on, step, you were already dealing with step three. Okay, so, so you didn't miss much, so I can actually tell you. So um, okay. uh, after the death certificate, we said the other important documents to consider is we must be able to identify all beneficiaries to the estate. So you would need to provide identity documents of beneficiaries to the deceased estate or alternatively birth certificates for the children of the deceased person. Does, does that assist you? Did you catch that, Ziander? Yes, I caught that um, you identify all beneficiaries. That means you bring their IDs or birth certificates. And then after that, it's That's step two, which is opening the state's bank account. Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you, Kyle. Pleasure. Uh, Kyle, it's Nico. Hi, Kyle. It's Nomsa. Okay, I know Nomsa was first, and then I heard, uh, I think, a Nico or Miko, something along those lines. So let's do Nomsa, and then we do that uh, that uh, gentleman. Go for it. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, for step three, section 29, advertisement. How many days does it go for? And then also the second question is, can we expect in the exam to be required to draft a will and to draft the LND account and stuff like that? And then can we okay. get the templates or should we copy and, and paste it from, from the book, the notes? Thank you. All right. So let's deal with your first part so the advertisement runs uh for for the length of time the newspaper is out for so it gets placed in the newspaper and the gazette and during the course of that newspaper's life before it gets replaced by a newspaper a new newspaper that's how long it runs for so it's just one advertisement in one one newspaper it doesn't need to be repeatedly done if, if that makes sense and then um regarding the second part Look, I don't know what they're going to ask you, but I doubt they would ask you to draft the will because that's too easy because there's no there's freedom of testation. I could ask you to draft any will and you can't be wrong ultimately because you can say what you want in it. I mean, as long as you remember the 
different possible subheadings we spoke about yesterday, um, it, would, it would be a too easy question for me. So I doubt they would ask you to draft the will. They might test you on the different clauses they're in with theoretical questions, maybe to see if you understand collation or section 2B, things like that. But I highly doubt they'd ask you to draft the whole will. But if they did, it's easy marks because there's no formal rule in the way you have to draft it. Regarding the LND account, I am almost 100% certain they are going to ask you to draft the liquidation and distribution account. That is a common question, and it is obviously the most toughest part of this course, which I'm sure they will, they will, will ask you to do. And um, to assist you, I have drafted uh, sort of an easy, practical manner of how an L&D account should look, which I'll be sending to all of you um, around lunchtime tomorrow. I'll be sending it to, to Zakiswa probably just before 2 o'clock tomorrow. She will then place it on the eLeader platform and we can share it. And we'll work of that tomorrow because to try and learn from the book is, is going to be too difficult, especially if you have no prior practical knowledge of the l and accounts. So I'll rather work from my notes regarding that tomorrow and Thursday. Okay, thank you so much. Perfect. Hi, Nico again here. Um, Nico. On, okay, on, on, yeah, step number six, which is the distribution of uh, the estate. Um, does does the payment of the estate uh, only come, which I think it would be, but only come at the end of all those steps, obviously just before seven? Um, is it possible to pay the estate sort of like in drips and drills, or is it one final payment that is made to all creditors, all beneficiaries, <coughs> all legatees, and all designated groups there? So are you referring to the executor's fees, your fees? No, no, no. The, 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 the payment oh, to okay. designated groups, whether these could be creditors, whether these could be beneficiaries and so on. In other words, can beneficiaries get you... a certain portion of uh, a payment now and probably get another portion at some stage or whatever they get, it's uh, the final payment that comes out when everything has been done? Okay. So, so Nick, it's almost like property law. You, you can only receive your payments when the job is done. So only at the very end are these people entitled to their full claims. They cannot be paid in drips and drabs. Where you yeah. see people be paid in drips and drabs is people who would maybe have a maintenance claim. Let's say I pass away, but I'm, I was providing financial support. Uh, I was maybe the breadwinner, and I leave behind a spouse and children. That spouse and children would probably need a maintenance claim so that they can survive while I am busy winding up the estate. So they, people with maintenance claims can usually obtain payments during the course of winding up the estate. But if you do not have a maintenance claim, you'll have to wait for the end. Oh, I see. Thank you. You are near for hundred percent. Okay, I heard Johan and then I heard, I think, Alessejo. So let's do Johan first. Thank you, Carl. Um, Carl, with uh, step three, section 29, um, the 30 days. Now, when the 30 days open, um, I just want to try to understand how does the executor determine the preference of the creditors? Now, I, let's say the estate is a thousand rand. I, as a creditor, call in. I've got a claim. I say I claim a thousand rand. What about the other creditors? Um, do, do they then get, uh, sorry, the, 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 there's no money left? Um, thank you, Carl. All right, Johan, so, so it, that's also a bit of insolvency law, but you have to look at preferential creditors. So your creditors with your main claims would obviously be SARS, the municipality, and your banks, especially with bonding over property. Um, they are your preferential creditors. Thereafter, you can move along to your concurrent creditors. So usually when we do all things like that, we look at the creditors with the biggest claims, and we judge them on preferential bank based on banking institutions and state institutions. They would become preferential. Thereafter, any money you owe John down the street or Edgar's or Vodacom, they would come sort of thereafter. Thank you, Carl. Perfect. Yes. I think um, it was a, was it a list? <laughs> yes, there we go. Go for it. Yeah. Yes, I just wanted to ask, um, you said that um, with us, we get paid 3.5%. Is that capped? 
Yes, well, would, so, so it's capped on 3.5% of the total asset value. So at least it's the gross value. So we just look at the total asset value of the deceased estate, which is obviously houses, property, money in the account, um, um, policies that paid out into the deceased estate. Um, uh, the total value of that, 3.5% of that is what you're entitled to. And yes, it's capped on that. Okay, thank you. Sepang here, Kyle. Perfect. Kyle Lawrence here. Yeah. Go for it. I think it was a, st a Stefan or something like that, and then there was a Lawrence. So let's do the first one. It's Sepang. A uh, Sepang. There we go. I'm just a little bit confused on the steps. Does Section 28 comes before Section 29 or the other way around? So when you refer to Section 28, what are you referring to? Um, opening uh, the estate banking account. Correct. So, so, so when you, if you look at the steps, you'll see step two was opening the deceased estate bank account. So that's the first duty. We go and open the bank account. Once that's been opened, then we go with our Section 29 advertisement to the creditors. All right. Thank you. Perfect. I think there was a Lawrence, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, yeah Carl, it's Lawrence here. OK, um, I just have a scenario. Let me say um, the, the deceased leaves uh, behind um, two, two, two kids and they don't know how to go about um, um, uh, uh, dealing with the estate. Who who should who, sh who should uh, who should approach the master? Should they approach the the, the, the attorney or should they how how do how do kids who are left behind the dependents of the disease go about that? Mm. Well, well, Lawrence, they would have two choices. They would either go and approach an attorney and say, "Listen, they will do an affidavit where they appoint the attorney to be executor of the deceased estate, and then the attorney will go and report the estate to the master's office and take it from there." Alternatively, they can yep. go straight to the master's office and appoint one of the two of them to be the executor. Um, or they can ask the master's office to appoint an executor for them. So they have options, uh, you know. Okay, okay. All right, got it. Thank you. Perfect. Go for it. I just like to know, does uh, life policies fall into the inventory? Uh, generally, no. It depends. You know, the thing is, if I have a life policy that says when I die, X must receive a payout of, let's say, a million. When I die, that life policy is going to pay X straight away a million rand. It's not going to fall back into my estate. So the answer is yes and no, and I'll speak to you about that tomorrow night because there is different scenarios. But generally, the school of thought is a life policy will pay out to the beneficiary and will not fall in our deceased estate. But there may be instances where it can fall into the deceased estate. But I'll talk to you more about that tomorrow evening. Okay. And then uh, just a quick one regarding the lack of authority and executorship. Is the only differences between the two is lack of authority uh, does not need to do the LND, and the lack of executor needs to do uh, LND account. Is that the Correct. only difference? Correct. Otherwise, the other state. Yeah, you must still, by law, follow the other steps. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Hi, Kyle. Yes, go for it. Oh, you said yesterday that uh, pension funds don't form part of the deceased estate, right? Because normally they're beneficiaries. Mm. So what happens when there's no beneficiary? Correct. And then it will unfortunately need to form part. Of the estate. So in, in a case see, where the, the deceased was married, sorry, and the spouse would probably claim half of her share in the deceased pension fund, right? Correct. So can the deceased estate also claim half of the deceased share in the spouse's pension? So, so, you know, pension funds are a funny thing and funds yeah, often know. have different rules depending depending yeah. on the type of fund brought forward. So what they okay. try to do is they try to ensure that the pension fund never forms part of the deceased estate as such. So okay. let's say there was no beneficiary for whatever purpose. 
automatically yeah. that person was married in community of property. Half mm. of that fund is for the spouse. So mm. they'll pay half over to the spouse. Mm. And the fund would often have its own rules over who should then be paid out, usually closest yeah. family members. And they will then pay out the people in accordance with the fund, what, okay. what, what the fund's rules are as such. So the general but, principle is that your pension fund does not form part of your deceased estate. Even if there's okay. no beneficiary, there is family members that they will directly pay out to. Oh, okay. So, but my question is, with regards to the deceased now, the deceased estate, does the deceased estate have a claim with the spouse who's alive? Does, do they have a claim against the pension fund for the spouse that's still alive in terms of their marriage? Oh, uh, yeah. So, so when you say the deceased estate, you mean the creditors for the deceased estate? No, like the executor of the estate. Can they claim the share, the, the no. deceased share, the spouse is alive, from the spouse is alive? No, 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 because it didn't form part of the estate. But in divorce matters, it forms part of the joint estate. No, it, it formed part of the estate the moment the divorce was concluded. But while they were married, it didn't. But the moment the divorce was concluded, then half was paid out to the spouse. So, so remember, we, we're only dealing with... Yeah, so, so we're only dealing with the state of the deceased person. There is no claim regarding what was paid out to the surviving spouse. Oh, okay. No, I understand now. Thank you. Perfect. So, Kyle, I think again. Isaac, I'm listening. Yes, Kyle. One last question is... If you've got a Section 18.3 estate, uh, which means that you will skip then point uh, steps 4 and 5 and go to the distribution of the estate. I just want to know the distribution, how will you do it then of the estate, uh, in, like the state uh, law or interstate law? And then do you also then need to send it to the master for the filing slip? Yes, yes. So you'll distribute in accordance to whatever the will says or whatever the interstate law calculation gives you. And when you're done, you still need to show the master's office so that they can sort of relieve you of your duties as such. Okay, and then you skip point four and five, the advertisement and the drafting of the R&D That gets skipped indeed. Okay, thank you. Gloria. Gloria. Yes, um, Carl, I wanted to find out the steps that you are referring to. Is it the same thing that is in the study guide from page 78 to 81? Because there seems to be more steps there. I'm actually getting a bit confused. Great. Ladies and gents, when you are done, go and look at your study guide. But I, I'm not here to read a, a book with you. That's for you all. I'm here to make sure that when you read your book, you clearly understand everything that's therein. You know, if we wanted to go through a study guide together, I'd need a semester with you. But the point is, when we're done with this, we're able to have a general understanding of testate law, interstate law, and winding up a deceased estate. So that when you go in your books and study it, things are making sense to you, in other words. But I unfortunately cannot cover everything in your books, so I sort of summarize it for you to make sure you clearly understand it. Okay, the reason why I'm asking is because there are more than seven steps in the study guide. I'm sure there is. I'm sure yeah. there is additional things it's about in between. 18. Yeah, have a look at it, but most some of the steps are not always applicable at all. Okay. You, I mentioned to you the applicable steps. Some things might differ depending from case to case, but as long as you have a general understanding on the steps that you need to follow, then the other steps will make sense to you. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay. Just like interstate law, I'm sure if you look at the book, it doesn't say there are five laws or rules to interstate law. No, no, no. It doesn't speak of five rules. These are This is my summary of what to follow in doing interstate law. So it just gives you the foundation so that when you look at your books, everything makes perfect sense because it's obviously difficult to study something you don't understand. And the point of this is to make sure when we study it, we're able to understand it because we have our basic understanding thereof. All right, thank you. Perfect, Gloria. Hi, hi Carl. Uh, hi, from, from what Gloria is saying, I wanted to clear something. Um, the steps. According to what I read, the bank account 
it's open, uh, the executor get to open the bank account after the notice of the creditors. So I want clarity on that. Which one is before which yeah. one? Is it the opening of the bank account after noti noticing the creditors or is it the other way around? Now it's look in practice we open the bank account first. That's the very first thing we do. So I don't know of opening it there after. I'm sure if you did it simultaneously it wouldn't be a headache. But in terms of procedures that we've been following in practice we open the bank account. That's the first thing we do because our duty is to close down the bank accounts of the deceased person and get the payout into the deceased estate bank account. So the longer we take to open the deceased estate bank account, the more we delay monies that should be paid into it. So it's the best bet to open that straight away. Okay. All right. Thanks, sir. Zama. Zama, I'm listening. Ladies and gents, just to just to um, clarify with you, sorry, Zama, before you continue, um, after Zama, we'll do okay. one more question for the evening. Eh? Okay, Zama, proceed. Um, just to get a clarity on this one, in terms of your Section 18.3 estate, isn't it that they get a letter of authority? Can they also claim a fee after finalizing everything to say, I've been running around doing everything for you, I need an extra money? for me doing what I was doing? Or is it only an executor that can claim the fee? No, no, a letter of authority, you're also entitled to your three and a half percent. Most definitely, you okay. get your executor's fees for that as well. Right. So remember, yeah, keep, Thank keep, you. keep in mind that even if you get a letter of authority, you are still the executor of the deceased estate. You just don't get a letter of executorship. So you're still entitled to your three and a half percent. Oh. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Hi, Zara. All right, so Zara will be the last one for the evening, ladies and gents. Keep in mind if I don't get to you, whatever you wanted to ask, tomorrow is a different night. Okay, Zara, let's let's hear you. Hey, sorry, Kyle. I may be backtracking a bit, but yesterday you said that if we had any questions about test state worlds, we could ask today. So I just 100%. have three questions, if that's okay. Go for it. Um. Okay, so my first question relates to the fideicomism. Um, I know that the testator bequeaths the property to X on condition that upon his death it will go to Y. Does that mean X gets temporary ownership? Um, well, I wouldn't call X a temporary owner. I would rather say X has a personal right there too. So X will never become owner of the asset, but has the personal right to make use of that asset during the course of his or her lifetime. You know, I'm just scared to use the word ownership with the first person to refer alchemism. Okay, so technically the only person who refer who will be called an owner will be the why the, the final the person. second one. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. And with regards to the elements of blameworthiness, if a testator committed suicide and say X was going to inherit from their estate, and it came about that X uh, verbally abused the testator. Am I correct in saying that if one can sufficiently prove to a court that the abuse led to the testator committing suicide, that would qualify as the element of blameworthiness and X would be disqualified? Sure, that's a tough one because, you know, I think that the difficulty therein is how do you prove to a court that what this person did led to that person um, committing a suicide, you know, because that person is obviously mm -hmm. not there to speak for themselves anymore, you know. So uh, I think you would struggle to disqualify a person based on that, you know, because when they speak of blameworthy, they speak, they refer to the, uh, the a blameworthy, you know, almost like a, a person is blameworthy for their death in terms of they had a, a illegal hand or a negligent hand in that caused the death of the other person. You know, if you told me this person is the one who gave the gun to the person who committed suicide, then I'd say, yeah, now we, we definitely in for disqualification. But to say that that person verbally abused the other person that resulted in it, I think you would have, have a tough time disqualifying such a person. Okay. All right. And um, yesterday I used an example where a daughter helped the mother draft a will 
And um, even though she, when she sufficiently satisfied the court that she didn't unduly influence the mother, she inherited interstate. If the mother had made her a legatee in the world, had specifically given her something, that would fall away. Yeah, that would unfortunately fall away because you could only inherit as per interstate law there. And in interstate, um, we don't have any legatees. Okay. All right. That's all my questions. Thank you so much. Perfect, Zara. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, it's already hitting half past eight. It's getting late. I think we should close down tonight's lecture. I think, uh, I mean, we got through interstate law. We finished wills. We've looked at the processes of winding up a deceased estate. Um, we can focus tomorrow night and Thursday night on, you know, how we'd go about drafting a and And again, ladies and gentlemen, if you ask a question tomorrow night or Thursday night, and it's something you wanted to ask regarding tonight's lecture, feel free to ask it as well. Doesn't mean you can no longer ask questions relating to wills or winding up a deceased estate. Your opportunity will still come. All right. From my end, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the rest of your evening. We'll be back at 5.30 tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank you. 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 Bye. 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 Bye.